I did meet her. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to episode 85 of The Horror of Babylon, where we discuss Salem's Lot 2004, starring Goth Rob Lowe. I am Ryan, and with me as always is Daniel. Say hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. And thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the, the Full, Full Metal, Metal Patron. Patron. And thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, or the Mall at Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you can say hello to the proprietor, Ronald III, Grampus of Christmas, unless in case it's one of his weekends to be in Portland, (laughs) at which case everybody else is okay with his life in Portland as long as we don't have to hear about it. Yeah, we don't want to hear about it or see it. (laughs) Uh, Trigger warning for the death of children. Someday we're going to we're going to watch or read something where children don't die or are not raped. Um, I don't know when that'll be. I don't know, man. It happens in like horror a lot. Yeah, but I feel like it's been especially prominent in the past few months. I'm all, I'm like currently rereading The Exorcist and I think we're going to have to put children trigger warnings in that. Yeah, we definitely are. <laughs> I mean that that whole story is basically the little torture girl, of torture, a child. Yeah, yeah. torture porn. <laughs> My uh, copy of Legion just came in. Yay! Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I got it. I ordered it on Audible when we uh, we decided we were going to do it. Okay, so our history with Salem's Lot 2004. Daniel, um, you told me we were going to review it, and I said okay. <laughs> I was aware it existed. Uh, I just had never gotten around to seeing it because it I, doesn't have a stellar reputation. It, yeah, it's like, I but think, it doesn't have have like a, a really bad reputation. Either. There, there's one time I almost bought it back whenever like physical media was more of a thing, mm-hmm. and you know I collect I collect horror movies and video games, and I was like, oh yeah, they did a Salem Slot remake. I don't know if I want to spend twenty bucks on that. Yeah, twenty sounds like a lot. Yeah, so I think it'd be a good five dollar DVD. Um, I watched it right after reading the book the first time and, and watching the original one. And just in general, I wasn't crazy about either miniseries, but there are certain things that this one does a lot better than the original. Mm-hmm. And then there are also some things that I think the original does much better. So in my opinion, we've still yet to get that Salem's Lot adaptation that we deserve. Oh, maybe, maybe soon. <laughs> but I think this one's a little... <laughs> I yeah. think this one's a little closer. It's yeah. it's in the right direction. The hour and a half long one's going to do it. I uh I watched a, a somebody who did a video update on that today. Yeah. And they said that uh they had a source who told them that they weren't releasing it or they at least weren't releasing it in theaters because they were afraid that the internet was just going to light it on fire primarily because the last Three of the last four Stephen King adaptations have done very poorly and been like universally maligned across the internet. They were Firestarter, The New Children of the Corn, which I have not seen, and then something that I forgot. I forget what it was. And then The Boogeyman, but of the four of those, The Boogeyman is, was like the highest rated yeah. generally among critics of the four of those movies. How did that do like box office wise? Can we look that up real quick? Yeah, because we actually never updated that. It probably did like, I would imagine middle like... It might, it might have made like a little bit of a profit maybe. Yeah. 
Let's, uh, let's take a look. Okay, actually pretty decent. Budget thirty five million, box office almost eighty two. So more than double. So so it made like. I, they probably weren't happy with the profit, but it made a profit. Yeah, I mean, it didn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a bomb. Yeah. And considering the other movie, like Mario was in theaters, uh, Guardians was in theaters. Yeah. I might have had a little crossover with Little Mermaid. Like it was. That was a rough time to be in movie theaters. So. Yeah. That's fair. The vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof. That the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today. Um, jumping into background, uh, Salem's Lot 2004 is a American two-part television miniseries, which first aired on TNT on June 20th and 21st in 2004. It is, of course, based on the novel Salem's Lot by Stephen King. It was directed by Mikhail Solomon, who directed two episodes of another Stephen King TNT miniseries, Nightmares and Dreamscapes. He also directed two episodes of Band of Brothers, and he was the cinematographer on Arachnophobia. I like Arachnophobia. I do, too. Uh, the teleplay was written by Peter Villardi, who wrote Flatliners, The Craft, and Chapelweight. Huh. I like two of those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this can, mini can you guess which two, Ryan? <laughs> Flatliners in the craft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, shot on location at Cressic and Woodend in Central Victoria, which is a state in Australia. So this was shot in Australia. Okay. Not Maine. Stephen King did not go to bat for Salem's Lot 2004. I wouldn't have gone to bat for this either. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he only did it for Pet Cemetery that I'm more aware of. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think he probably only got that because of the writer strike that was yeah. happening. They really need to make to make that movie. And that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle. Good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four acts. Um, so structure and themes, and we're going to start with a little bit of discussion of structure, and we're going to kick it off. With the frame narrative. <laughs> so, what are your comments on the frame narrative? Uh, it, this was one of those times whenever I started the movie and thought it was playing the wrong movie. Yep. Uh, you get Ben. He, 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 I didn't know it was Ben. Because I didn't know who played. Like, I can't recognize actors right away very well. It's Rob Lowe. And uh, he shows up at, like, a, a soup kitchen and starts chasing a priest around who pulls a gun on him. And I'm like, you don't remember this part in the book? And I'm sitting there like, is this Taken Three? Did I put in Taken Three? <laughs> Just something like that. I, I didn't know what I was watching. And I was like, is that supposed to be Father Callahan? <laughs> and then they both end up in the hospital, and a nurse or a doctor or somebody's all like, uh, tell me why I, as a good Christian man, shouldn't just let you die right now. <laughs> that's not very tip. That's not very Christian to me. I mean, it's also not very. Uh, Hippocratic oath to me. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah, I'm sitting there like, okay, but d d the line was a little goofy, and then I was like, oh, he's gonna tell the story of Salem's Lot from a hospital bed. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I do have the right thing. <laughs> so generally, I like frame narratives, but I like there are some really iconic frame narratives out there, like uh, Princess Bride with uh, what's his face uh, reading the story to his grandson who's sick in bed, but. This one just seems like awkward and unnecessary and very confusing to people who have read the book. Yeah. Um, they don't spend a lot of time on the frame narrative, so it's not like you're constantly going back to the hospital, which is good, but I still was not a fan of the idea in general. Yeah. Uh, so it's updated from the 70s to the 2000s. Uh, people do have smartphones, but they don't... Or, I'm sorry, they do have cell phones, but they don't have smartphones. And it doesn't make too much of an impact on the story. Yeah. Uh, it just seems like they replace the phone... Whenever they use a phone in the book, they just replace it with, like, a flip phone out of your pocket. It's not, like... It's not really a story where, like, a a cell phone just completely destroys the whole premise. Mm -hmm. um, so, generally... 
as as a straight like adaptation structure themes story characters uh which miniseries do you think is better and why like in terms of being an adaptation with themes and stuff yeah um ju- just taking that into consideration this um i think that it hits a lot of the points that the novel tried to hit more uh how well it hit them is debatable but so it reminds me a lot of the shining miniseries yeah where it's clearly the better adaptation but not necessarily the, the more movie. the more entertaining piece of media yeah uh it, it delves a lot deeper into the tertiary characters the world building you get to see all the little e- evil you get to see like the ver- all the various different little not all of them but a lot of the various subplots that are in the book they spend a lot more time on that Rather. Um, that stuff I actually ended up liking a decent amount. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of my problems with this movie are like technical stuff, which we can get into in a little bit. And that, generally speaking, if you had if you had me give my opinion on the two Salem's Lot miniseries, I would say that the in terms of production, the original is better. In yeah. terms of adaptation and story, I like this one better. Yeah, because I'm sitting there like, even compared to the like made in the 70s uh, miniseries this movie when I'm sitting there watching it looked and felt cheap yes and I was like man and there was like anytime there was a flashback when they do like that weird camera stuff with the kids running Mm -hmm. I hate when to me that always takes me out of it to just have a flashback however it is very typical for TV movies and miniseries of that time frame yeah Uh, I mean you're not wrong it re- it reminds me a lot of Firestarter Two. <laughs> it does. Oh my god! Have you seen the Nightmares and Dreamscapes miniseries? Mm-hmm. It's like the same like production team. Okay, and it, it they feel very similar. And th- that that's a lot of the stuff that ended up taking me out of a lot of the scenes in the movie. It would if you could have taken this script and given it to the people who made the original one. Yeah, maybe I would- honestly think that might have been great. Or even just, I don't think all the actors were bad. I think that maybe the directing was bad because a lot of them, in some scenes, they were doing pretty good, and in other scenes, I'm like, that kind of like soap opera. We're gonna com- compare and contrast the performances. Yeah. I-, I like some of them more in the original. I like some of them more in this one. It's kind of a mixed bag. They're coming to get you, Barbara. All right, so let's jump to characters and let's start with Ben Mears, who's played by. Rob Lowe in this, David Soul in the original. It, first, before we compare the two, let's kind of talk about how he's different in this one. One, obviously, he wears all black yeah, all the time. I, <laughs> he's Daniel with a trench coat. <laughs> he, people like to call him like goth, but I, I, I think don't he's, know. I think he's more like Gen X. Yeah, he's he's more like uh, someone who just saw The Matrix and discovered smoking when he was sixteen. He is extremely cynical. Yeah. Uh, so much so that he is one of the last people to like come around on vampires being real, as opposed to the book and the original miniseries where he's much more. Uh, he swallows the idea a lot sooner. Yeah. They also increase the his role in what happens at the Marston house. What did you think of that? Uh, I didn't really care for that. Um, mostly just because it seemed like. Uh... A needless added layer of complexity to me. Um, to me, it was always enough that he was just afraid of the haunted house as a kid, mm-hmm. and he was coming back to a a place, you know, after his wife died, and he's that. That's what he's really grappling with is, and the Marston house is more of like a uh, way to help deal with what his true horror is, which is you know, getting over the death of how his like wife died in that motorcycle accident. So. I said that they didn't build out his character enough or talk about his past enough in the book. Yeah. And I still agree. I still think that's the case. They do so more here. It's not exactly what I would have wanted, though. I I would have preferred more stuff on his, like, wife as opposed to more stuff on the Marston house. I'm glad they picked one and stuck to it instead of trying to... F- add more to both of those aspects of him 
Oh yeah, I def I don't want I don't want both. Yeah. But and it doesn't help that the entire like scenes in the Marston house were really hokey to me. Uh in the past, the, the present is fine. Yeah, but the, the you, I talked about how it looks soap opery and cheap. Yeah, and it kept coming up, and I'm like, why am I leaving the the scenes that look decent to go to this? It has that like red, yeah, that like tint filter, and a uh, shaky cam, mm -hmm. but slow motion shaky cam, so I know it's the past. It's very, very <laughs> yeah. typical of the time. It is very typical of the time. I just don't miss that time. Yeah, <laughs> so and then. In terms of comparing him to David Soul, I prefer Rob Lowe, but I am extremely biased when it comes to Rob Lowe. Uh, I love him in the Orville, love him in Wayne's World. Uh, he was one of the highlights in the original The Stand miniseries for me. So I'm very biased. Who, who do you like, Rob Lowe or David Soul? They're about the same. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm just. Uh, I th I think that a lot of the things that he did well here were hindered by everything else going on around him. I think that with a higher with with more money and some different direction, this maybe could have been the ad adaptation we want. Yeah, I I, th I th and that's probably why I'm going to be so harsh on it. Mm -hmm. Is uh I I the closer you get to being right and then fumbling, the matter I get. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's like uh. God, when we talked about Ring Cause and Bond right at the end. Yeah. I was like, how did you fumble? You were almost just an adaptation. Almost. <laughs> okay. Uh, Excuse me. Samantha Mathis plays Susan Norton. Now, I complained that I didn't feel like Ben and Susan had very much chemistry in the original miniseries. What did you think of Ben and Susan in this miniseries? Um... It was okay. A lot of times I was sitting there going, do you guys even like each other? There, there's like, there were some scenes where I, they felt almost antagonistic. I feel like you can't even really call them a couple. Yeah. And I'm like, it, it seems like she wants to argue with them all, and that's fine, but it's not what... I kind of like it and I kind of don't. Yeah. I don't like it because it's not what happens in the book. But I kind of like it because it actually makes a little bit more sense than what happens in the book because they just they have just met each other. Yeah. And the what happens in the book is a very like storybook romance, like oh I see you in the park, we talk, we by the end of the night I know you're the one, like kind of thing. And in this, like you could see like there's a little bit of chemistry, and maybe if they had been together for a while, they might get together at some point. Yeah. But it's more. But it's more it's a little more grounded in reality. It's a little more cynical. I think this whole this whole adaptation is a little more cynical. It's two thousands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. In terms of performance, I don't think Samantha Mathis is bad, but I actually do think I like the Susan in the original a little more. Yeah. Um and maybe that's just because she felt antagonistic towards Rob Lowe the whole time. And you, you can't fuck with my Rob Lowe. Yeah. I will, I will scratch you. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, and I don't even like mind like uh, female characters that don't like the main male character. But I guess I was going in expecting one thing, and I got the exact opposite. Yeah, uh, I do like how she's written with her mother because like, yeah, it Susan's relationship with her mom is core to her character and it was a big fault for me that they completely left that out of the original mm -hmm. and this seems very it, it, it's very important to me that they brought it back for this one yeah no i agree uh, and her the lady who plays her mom is does bitch <laughs> does, she does so bitch well. pretty well very stephen king mom like oh my god god you know what's so weird is stephen king writes so many like bitch moms mm-hmm but everything I've read, he seemed to have like a great relationship with his own mom. Yeah, it's his dad that he. We don't really know what he had, what kind of relationship he had with his dad, and it's kind of assumed that it was bad. Oh wow. Um. Okay, keep going. Dan Bird plays Mark Petrie. Go ahead. <laughs> I just I was sitting there the whole time, but go. I kept forgetting that was supposed to be Mark. He feels different. I think they tried to write him a little more realistic, which 
I guess is good, but it also doesn't really feel like the same character. I see. I was so fine with the Mark not being realistic because he was just like a hyper nerd. So he he was that kid. To me, in the book, he was that kid that probably had a couple of friends. So he dived into books all the time. So that's how we knew Houdini tricks or knew how or knew vampires were scared across because he collected stat. Like today's equivalent would be someone like us with like anime statues instead. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, he 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 has a, maybe a few good friends. Both of them end up dying, <laughs> and so he he dives even further into his stuff and his superstitions. And uh, this, I'm like, they and again, this whole movie like ups the cynical. Mm-hmm. He felt like a little punk. Yeah, which it, that's fine. It's just so the way I rationalized it to myself. Uh, is that gifted children often do become troublemakers because they get bored. Yeah. And that's that's just like a, how how I kind of saw this. It's like, oh, he's just he's really smart. He's smarter than his bus driver. So, of course, he causes problems with his bus driver. I'm not crazy about this adaptation of Mark either, but I'm not crazy about Mark to begin with. So I it's not a it's not a key thing for me. I actually really liked Mark in the original, so... I liked it. The, I liked him the first... He was he and Matt Burke were probably my two favorite characters the first time I read the book, mm-hmm. and the second time they just annoyed the piss out of me. <laughs> that happens. Speaking of Matt Burke, uh, this one wins just because his name is Matt, not Jason. <laughs> Jason yeah. <laughs> yeah, W. <laughs> what uh, do you think of uh, Andre Brower? Like his acting and stuff, he's just pro- in general, the the he's, character, the actor. He, I think he was probably the best actor in this. Yeah. For for how old was he? Like fifteen, sixteen, playing like a fourteen year old. No, oh, I'm sorry. We we jumped to. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, let's go ahead and give your opinion on the. On oh, Dan, uh, Dan Bird. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, yeah. he was he did. I think the he job. was probably the best actor in the movie. He. Which that surprised me. He he's high. He's high up there. I'm not sure uh, who I who I prefer. Um, overall, but yes, he was very good. Okay, so now we're, now we're on Matt. Yeah, who is played by Andre Brower, who is also the douchey neighbor in The Mist, who was probably the best performance in that movie. Yeah. Um, what did you think of Matt Burke in this adaptation? Uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, I had a suspicion whenever we reread Salem's Lot that I didn't bring up when we were talking about the book. I was like, is he supposed to be gay? And then in this, I'm like, oh, okay, so maybe, maybe, yeah, um, um, because they talk in the book, they kept talking about how he's a bachelor, mm-hmm. and uh, he's all cool, cool and hip, and he's always going to the city and stuff. I'm like, is he going to a gay club? And I, I was like, I didn't want to bring it up because I'm like, am I reading too much into this as a stereotype? No, that would be that would definitely be a stereotype that Stephen King would use. Yeah, I I, I should have brought it up when we talked about the book. I only think Stephen King didn't make him gay because it was his second novel. And it's the nineteen seven or wait, when did the book come 75. out? Seventy five. Seventy five, yeah, yeah. So So I if I think that he wrote this book like year in like the eighties, I a hundred percent think Matt Burke would have been gay. Yeah. And uh I talk about I you know, you've heard me all the time, I don't like it when they change character sexualities. Mm-hmm. Uh but this one I saw a bunch of what I thought were either hints or innuendos. I'm like, yeah, no, this is one where I'm like, yeah, go ahead and just do that. Which is, you also get that great scene where sexy Mike Ryerson takes off yeah. his shirt and M- Matt Burke's like, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a little flustered. <laughs> I thought the scene was a little goofy, but it was, but it was, but it, was it was funny. funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and it, there's, I, there, I know there's a universe where that scene could have been tragic and mm-hmm. haunting looking. But when I'm sitting there watching it, I'm laugh. I, no, I laugh too. I wish I wish you could have seen how much I was laughing. No, I, I also thought it was funny. Uh, no, I think he did a decent job. Yeah. Um, uh, full spoiler podcast. I like his death in this. Yeah, his death scene was awesome. Yeah, this is what it feels like, and I'm like, you know what? Vampires should do this to people more often. Yep. <laughs> like if they want to kill somebody. You ever been staked through the heart? It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> like, that just makes sense to me. Like, they almost did it in uh, Salem's Lot too. Yeah. And I'm, and the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm like, if I was a vampire and someone was hunting me, this is what I would do to the people hunting me. Just be like, yeah, what do you think it would feel like? <laughs> he's also, he's kind of a jerk. 
to uh, to Ben. Yeah. In the beginning, um, but like it fits like the overall like more snarky tone of the movie. Of yeah. the yeah, and it also it just kind of works with Andre Brower because he usually plays like that type of character. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to compare him to the the guy who played Jason Burke in the original because the characters are just so different. Yeah. Um, I do I do like this actor though. Yeah, I've seen him in a bunch of things, and he's he usually does a really good job. Yes, Father Fucking Callahan, he's a real person. Uh, aside from him in the frame narrative, set, yeah. setting that aside, I really love Father Callahan in this. I like that he drinks. <laughs> I you literally meet him with he's he almost runs over Danny Glick. He gets out of his car and like. Uh, liquor bottles spill spill out onto the road, and he's panicking because he thought he hit the kid. <laughs> and you even get like a hint at like his inner struggle because when he has his meeting with Weasel Craig, he's like, "I also got good news, news of a real battle, one worthy of or something." Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't go like super deep into it like the novel does. But it it's at least there. It, it exists for you. What, what do you think of Father Callahan? Um, I liked everything except uh, the frame narrative mm-hmm. and sort of where they go with the ending with them. Yeah, I I prefer the book where he he gets turned and then he just kind of bails. Um, and I actually think if they would have done that it would have made more sense with a frame narrative. Yeah. Because there would have been, like, more reason for Ben and Mark to be upset with him. Yeah. For bailing on them. Uh, but I'm just happy that he's here and that he's doing something, as opposed to the original. What do you think the Father Callahan's going to get to do in, in the new one? I don't remember nothing. <laughs> there will be no time. Is he even on the cast list? I don't, oh my god, that's the character they cut. Matthew Burke, Ben Mears, Mike Ryerson, Richard Straker, Father. Ca- okay, so yeah, he is on here. John Benjamin Hickey. I don't. He looks kind of familiar. Flags of Our Father, Transformers: Revenge of the Fall. I've seen these movies, but I don't know who he is. Jessica Jones. Yeah, I don't, I don't know this person. That's okay. Well, he's okay. He's in the movie, in <laughs> in some in some variation. He's um, gonna show up and he'll, he'll look at a vampire. And go, are you little evil or big evil? <laughs> <laughs> I've come to fight big evil and little evil, and I'm all out of little e's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be his Kick character. your butt with a cac- capital K. Yeah. Oh, did Kurt Barlow has the same initials as Kick Butt? <laughs> okay. Uh, Robert Mamone, or maybe it's Mamone, uh, Dr. Jimmy Cody. Not a fan of Jimmy Cody in the book, and they just kind of write him out of the original miniseries. Yeah. I think this is the best version of that character because they, they flesh him out and give him a little more to do, but he's still like the weakest one of the group I'd say yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say about him so it, it was I like that they tied him in to like some of the little e evil by making you know showing his weakness and and having sex with a patient and then turns out oh he gets blackmailed yeah and it it does both the affair subplot and the the people in the trailer with the baby subplot mm-hmm. and ties it into him but I mean, that's kind of what they had to do to this character to make him matter, is to tie him into other subplots. <laughs> In terms of a performance, I, I thought he did a pretty decent job. Yeah, he was acceptable. Yeah, he was definitely like that, as as Hef likes to call him, that hey buddy yeah, he's, character. Yeah, he's probably the person I have the least amount to say on. Um, I forgot that they changed the knives to a saw. Yeah. And that actually got a reaction out of me. Uh, I saw the saw at the beginning of the movie, like when uh, Ben shows up to town. I'm like, oh my god, they're going to make the doctor fall on that. I, <laughs> and... I, I'd never put two and two together, but I did hear it. So mm-hmm. here's how here's how little I remembered 
of the first time me watching it. When he opens the door, mm-hmm. you can hear the saw. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is that noise? Is it, oh, did they, like, are they leaking gas so that it, like, explodes and kills Dr. Cody? No, it was a saw. So I had a pretty genuine reaction to that. Yeah. Um, I-, I thought it was pretty great, so. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, and Donald Sutherland playing Richard Straker. Uh, is Mark on the naughty list forever for killing Santa Claus? Yes. I thought this guy was so fucking... Like, it was a choice. I don't know if it was the actors or the directors, but it was a choice. I thought he was so goofy throughout this whole movie. He was okay. <laughs> I definitely prefer James Mason in the original. Uh, I'm just sitting there going, James Mason should have just been the vampire, and I'm sitting here and watching this and going, oh, God, it should have just been James Mason. <laughs> I prefer Straker in the original. I prefer Barlow in the remake. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of Robert Halger as Barlow? I would like something in the middle. Yeah, like I don't think it's perfect, but I, I do. I do like it more than the original. Yeah, I, this is what happens in the book. He just yeah. shows up as an old guy gets younger. Uh, I'd like vampires to be a little monstrous, or I'd like. Oh God, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of like a great example. Because, like, big, fake, sharp teeth, that makes an actor hard to perform. Mm -hmm. But when I'm sitting there and they just look like just a dude, at the same time, I'm also like, I don't know. I like the eyes that they did for the vampires. Yes, I I liked all of them. They all looked really cool. I thought Susan, Vampire Susan, looked pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know if I like it more than Vampire Susan in the original, but it's still pretty cool. I I think I would like something that's, like, in between the monstrous entity from the original and the accurate adaptation of this. I think I'd like in the middle, but leaning towards this. Yeah. Uh, Here, This is a funny quote that I found from Rob Lowe's memoir, Love Life. Uh, about Robert Hauer, who plays Bert, uh, Car- Bert Carlo, Car- Kurt Barlow. Uh, I once starred in a big mini series that culminated with the villain giving a two page monologue trying to goad me into killing him. The actor playing the bad guy wanted to ad lib his own version of the movie ending speech. Although he was playing a vampire, he went into a, sil- a, sil- a soliloquy about being a cowboy. The director was not impressed. After a very tense negotiation, the actor was forced to shit-can his self-pinned opus and stick to the original script. There was only one problem. He hadn't bothered to learn it. (laughs) I think that's hilarious. (laughs) Can you imagine, like, you're an actor, and you you have this monologue to learn, and you're like, this is shitty. I'm going to write my own. And you l- write your own, you learn your own, you go on set, the director says no, and he tells you to do it the way it's written in the script, and you're like, well, I didn't learn it that way, so I don't know what it says. <laughs> uh, y- usually I'm like, uh, pro strikes, but I hear stuff like this, so I'm like, maybe actors are getting paid too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I hear this, uh, God, it like reeks of like self importance. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and unlike the original, we actually have like some of our uh, tertiary characters that we can talk about, and we don't need to talk about all of them. Weasel. Weasel, but uh, Weasel was good. Like, yeah, I, I liked Weasel. I I loved as Weasel and Eva Miller's uh like kind of romance is one of my favorite subplots in the book and i love the church scene yeah the church scene is awesome i was like why couldn't the whole movie be just like this my (laughs) one of my favorite lines in the entire miniseries is this is my choice i was like that's kind of (laughs) hot could you imagine you love someone so much you're willing to damn your eternal soul for them (laughs) <laughs> no, not really. I mean, it's yeah. super romantic. Yeah. Um, but you also get Dud Rogers. Yes, you do. And his uh, romance with Ruthie Crockett. These were also some choices. Um, and they also decided to turn Larry Crockett into a daughter molesting pedophile. Yeah. Which... It's also a choice. It's also a choice. I, but I feel like that's if Stephen King had thought of it, he probably would have done it. 
the ground and then like, oh yeah, that's super hot. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> um, and you get, we've already mentioned the McDougals, who, the, the trailer folks, and I, they do a really good job with like the set dressing to make it like a really shitty trailer and a really shitty trailer park and yeah. you really feel like what's going on there. And then you get uh, Mike Ryerson and Floyd Tibbetts. Oh, what did you think of uh, the scene in the the jail where Floyd tries to go through the grate between the cells and kill Ben? It was okay. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. This is... um, I felt like I was watching something that they stole from a Junji Ito manga. Mm -hmm. The way he, like, squished himself in there and, like, kind of... I don't know it, it was kind of reminding me like oh was this an Uzumaki? <laughs> I don't remember this an Uzumaki. It does seem something like that you would see. I, w I wish it would have looked a little better. Yeah, but it was a money thing. Yeah, so but I, I, I hate to keep harping on it. But it, it was just like it was that era where CG was finally like cheap enough for everybody to start using it mm -hmm. but it was really bad. Yeah. So it was like the the death throes of practical effects and like only like the the top only like the most high end things like Lord of the Rings did like really good CG but and then like TV productions that were using CG it just looked awful like every time a vampire died in this I was like I should, yeah I can no one can see the face I'm making but I wasn't pleased no I'll kill you all <laughs> I'll drive you crazy and I'll kill you all I'm every nightmare you ever had I am your worst dream come true I'm everything you ever were afraid of To scary shit Where I'll ask our typical question Is this miniseries scary? Um, I was not scared by it Um No, I, w I was not either I think it Especially because and like I hate to keep comparing it to the original. No, that's kind of what we're here to do. Uh, like the vampires at the windows in the original, where there's this like booming music and it's all silent, and there's like this ambient fog coming in. Where in this, you have like one of them like darting around a hospital bed, talking really fast, mm -hmm. and they're like it was they were like the flash, like vampire yeah. flash, and then they're over the top hissing. Mm -hmm. And I know that's the thing that vampires do in media, but I always hate it. I just the, the strengths of the original to me are are tone and music yeah. and practical effects and the weakest parts of this one are the CG effects and just like atmosphere. I think the best part in this movie is literally that weasel scene at the church because that's mm -hmm. genuinely kind of haunting and romantic all like rolled into one scene. Yeah, it was it's really great. I love that scene. Uh, even though I'm not crazy about this this scene altogether the only thing that i thought was kind of effective was the the dead child in the bathtub mm -hmm. and that's mostly because it was a dead child and it was the way that it, they produced it he he looked like kind of skinny like he, he had been starving yeah kind of skeletal uh i don't like uh i don't think it's scary but i do uh, like at the end when the town's burning and the vampires are crawling out of everything, mm -hmm. that just—I was like, oh, that's kind of effective because it makes you think of like everywhere they could be hiding. Yeah, th it doesn't really get into that in the book. It just says that they're like in houses. Uh, uh, it just says like the like this one's in an attic, this one's in a closet. But here, like you see them like coming out of like sewer grates and other like unintuitive places where they could be sleeping. And you know, you sit there and think about it, going, yeah burning the town down might not do everything you need. Which, it, it doesn't. Like, yeah, it, it, yeah. it fails in the book, which we don't find out until One for the Road, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, it also fails in the the miniseries verse because Return to Salem's Lot <laughs> exists. Yeah. Um, I, even though, apparently, that's a completely separate group of vampires. But we, but we managed to make it canon. Yeah, <laughs> we, we did. We're genius. Hire us Writers Guild of America. Well, they need people. <laughs> uh, okay. Take it, Winky. Uh, so we talked about the vampires. We talked about the tone. We talked about what was kind of effective. Is there was like was there like one particular scene? You mentioned the Marston House mm -hmm. flashback. 
Was there another particular scene that you really thought was like not effective, not scary, just kind of annoyed you? Uh, the when the first uh, vampire kid shows up for his brother, Ralphie Glick shows up. I in the was hospital. like, this is so fucking goofy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. a, a lot of the vampire scenes were honestly kind of goofy, and I, I'm spoiled on vampire media too. Yeah, and there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. Yeah. And this was like it took some of the worst parts of the the bad ones, and mm -hmm. it was just everywhere. Yeah, like it's very understandable because of what it is mm -hmm. and the time period it comes from. But even yeah. though it's understandable, that, that doesn't, doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thankfully, it it has some strengths in other ways. <laughs> going to kiss me fat boy we are going to play i was calling it hot or not salem's lot edition but you i know you really like smash or pass <laughs> I so mean, i i like the i like uh this for this particular one all right so, so we'll say hot or not i will there's a go link in, to a google drive with these pictures <laughs> so you can play along at home uh we're gonna start with goth rob Lowe, hot or not. Uh, he's not my type. Uh, I think uh, he's not exactly my type, but I will say I will say hot nonetheless because I love me some Rob Lowe. Mm -hmm. uh, Andre Brower this in is uniform. Closer to my type. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of feeling this. He's not so much a physical attraction to me as it is like a an attraction to a man with a confidence and authority. I feel, I feel like in a certain universe I could call this guy daddy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I believe he's also gay in this show. But. <laughs> Is he gay in real life? Uh, maybe. Not that that matters to me. No. A actors are actors, but... No. Oh. At least according to Google. Ooh, celeb gaydar. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, this should have been our... Uh, celeb gaydar. So, actors list. The list of is Luke Gage. I don't know who that is. Is Elijah Wood gay? No, I'm pretty sure he's not. John Cena gay. <laughs> is Noel Fisher gay? Is Jack McBrayer? All right, this could be a pre-show. Yeah, sometimes. This, uh, this should be. That's going to be a pre-show. Okay. All right, 2004 Wood. Vampire Susan. Wood. Yes. <laughs> 1979 Vampire Wood. Susan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Salem's Lot would not have burned to the ground in the universe <laughs> that Daniel had to fight this. Nope. <laughs> no. Same for me. David Soul. Uh, no, thank you. This is his. Uh, this is him on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, but this is the picture you showed. <laughs> <laughs> so no. Uh, Adrian Brody. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, kind of, pretty good. Yeah, he kind of has like a. It's weird. He has like this weird mix of soft and masculine features. Yeah. It's very distinct. It's a very distinct face. I think he's a very attractive man. Yeah. Straker's first victim. <laughs> <laughs> I played the fifth. <laughs> I'm gonna say pass. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. Uh, Kings and Koontz. Daniel, what is your king for Salem's Lot 2004? Oh, the church scene I keep bringing up because it was genuinely kind of great. Yeah, it was It was spectacular. I think mine is just Father Callahan and the presence of Little E. Evil in this as opposed to the OG. Yeah. Uh, and your Koontz. Uh, the Marston House flashbacks because I, I was taken out of the movie every time they came up. I don't... I came up with a Koontz and I don't remember it. <laughs> is it Lolita? Is Lolita your Koontz? Yes, Lolita <laughs> yeah. is my Koontz forever. That was a great gag, by the way. You caught me off guard. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, th this makes me want to get a PC even more so I can edit videos for this. Yeah. Okay, so rankings. I already ranked mine and. I don't. I put it like two spots above the. Okay, so the original I had at number forty-seven, which just below Pet Cemetery twenty nineteen, and mm -hmm. I just put this one two slots above. Like I said, I'm not crazy about either one. I'm gonna put the newer one a little bit above the original because the more 
it's more faithful to the book and the aspects that are more important to me that being the world building the tertiary characters the little e evil okay but i don't think either of them is the adaptation that we deserve oh. okay i liked it more than pet cemetery 2019 I liked it, so I'm going to have to put it right below Uzumaki. So it's your new number, 52. Yeah. So yeah, we had it pretty close. You had it at 52, yeah, I think that, I had it at and, 45. Yeah, and that, that middle-ish, well, middle-ish. Yeah, low, lower, low, lower middle-ish. Lower range. middle-ish. Like, it's not, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. No. I could watch it again, but yeah, it's... I sort of reserve, like, my top... 10 top 15 for things that I could just put in almost any time and watch and the bottom ones are things that I will probably never revisit and things in the middle are like yeah not mad if it's on yeah yeah that's probably a pretty fair way to look at it okay um scroll up to the top of yours okay uh for zombie day just real uh quick things. Rob Lowe was in The Stand. Andre Brower was in The Mist. Uh, the guy who plays... Shut Fa- up, Cujo! <laughs> oh, that was... Yeah, the wonderful Cujo reference. Love those really subtle Stephen King Easter eggs. Um, also, the guy who plays Father Callahan, James Cromwell. Aside from being one of my favorite Star Trek actors, he was also in The Green Mile. Mm-hmm. So, another Stephen King appearance. Uh, for homework... 2004 Salem's Lot updated Ben Mears to be more of a Gen X cynic. How would Ben Mears, the millennial, battle vampires? Uh, he wouldn't. He would complain on Twitter and ask the boomers and Gen Xers to fix it. <laughs> uh, so Ben Ben Mears, the millennial, would vote Democrat so that the government can spend more er, money on anti-vampire measures. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Mm-hmm. A question for the listeners. What's your favorite piece of Salem's Lot media? And why is it a return to Salem's Lot? <laughs> Reach out to our, us on your socials and let us know what's your favorite. I imagine for most people it's either the book or the original miniseries, but uh, let us know, and especially if you have a dissenting opinion. And then for further reading, uh, I, I mentioned Firestarter 2 really in the same uh, realm of Stephen King miniseries, also Nightmares and Dreamscapes, and the, the 1997 adaptation of The Shining. They all they all feel very similar to this. I can't wait for the day we talk about Firestarter 2. <laughs> we did. We did an episode on Firestarter 2. Oh, uh, I, shit. Carrie 2. Oh, yeah. The Rage. Yeah, Carrie the two. Rage. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Did you know our Firestarter 2 episode is like, uh, I think it's a, it's in our top like six or seven highest viewed videos. Because everyone YouTube. wants to hear us talk about Sexy Charlie. She's Sexy Charlie. <laughs> and, and we're drawing red corn. <laughs> right, bird. <laughs> Charlie Mickey. <laughs> I want to know you. <laughs> uh, not in a biblical sense. Gross. Uh, you can say that as many times as you want, Stephen King. We don't believe you. All right, so upcoming on the Horror of Babylon, next week, Sunday, August 13th, we are wrapping up Salem's Lock coverage, at least until the movie comes out, if it ever does, with <laughs> Chapel Wait, starring Adrian Brody from 2021. And then the next Sunday, August 20th, we are finally going to give you our review on the last voyage of the Demeter. I did meet her. <laughs> I, w- I was excited for her until I saw the trailer, but that doesn't mean it won't be good. Um, and then our next two Thursday bonus episodes on August 10th, we are continuing the Alienathon with Alien Cubed. And then we are returning to Treehouse of Horror of Babylon Thursday, August 17th, with the first. Simpsons Frankenstein parody If I Only Had a Brain. Oh, that's going to be fun. Which the title is, of course, a uh, a reference to the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> if I Only Had a Brain. 
Thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker Chains, Mama Dragons, and Logan, the Full Metal Patron. And thank you to Forrest McComics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, or the Mall Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I just got word uh, that Ron is back from his latest trip from Portland. Uh, he seems to be walking a little strangely, but other than that, he seems to be in a very chipper mood. I love it when he's in a chipper mood. Me too. Me too, especially when he's in a chipper mood when I get to go to Portland with him. All right, uh, thank you for watching Sounds Lot 2004 and recording with me tonight. It was honestly, I think this was a great discussion. I had a good time. Yeah, it was, and like it's it's not the best thing out there, but you know you can have. We some had fun. stuff to talk about. Yeah, we did. It wasn't I, like I, oh. I, I prefer when we have things to talk about mm -hmm. uh, over anything else. Yeah, uh, you, even if it's us disagreeing or if it's us having oh, this is where it works and stuff. Yeah. Anything with that we get that's like truly mid, I just I I can't stand those nights. Yeah, thank you, River River of Teeth. <laughs> Stay scary. <laughs> Stay scary. <laughs> and now for the obligatory socials, please like, share, and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary. Welcome to episode 85 of Salem... <laughs> Salem's Lot! It feels like episode 85 of Salem's Lot. It's the 58th episode of Lots of Salem. Mm -hmm.